good day to you. I'm Marie Walker, and today I am joined by from some very special friends who are going to tell us more about their stories and the time periods in which they lived. So we're going to start with Kaya, or Kaya Atonmai, which is her full name, which means she who arranges rocks, because that was the first thing that her mother saw after she was born, was a woman arranging rocks in a sweat lodge. So Kaya was part of the Ninipu people, or Nini, Ninmipu. But today, they're known as the Nez Pierce, and it's Nez Pierce, or Ne Pierce, which is the very French pronunciation of it, which means pierced nose. Now, they were given that name by French settlers um, around the time that Kaya lived, which was in 1764. Uh, That's when her stories take place. So here she is. She can wave hi. Um, and at the time, it was a very interesting world for the, the Nez Pierce or Ninibu because their world was about to drastically change. So if we have a snapshot of Kaya here in 1764, living a life that was very similar to the lives of her ancestors for thousands of years. Um, but by the end of her life, we know that it would have changed fairly drastically because of um, European settlers coming to America. But in 1764, we, we see some influence of that, like the name uh, Ne Pers or Nez Pierce, which was given to them by the, the French settlers. And they were given that name be pretty much by mistake. Uh, the French settlers mistook the Nimipu for a different tribe that would pierce their nose with shells. So it, you, as you can see, Kaya does not have um, any type of nasal piercing. That was not necessarily common among her people. Uh, and it's, but the name stuck somehow and uh, the tribe adopted it and that is what they are known as today. <clears throat> uh, Kaya, uh, her first name was Kaya, but through the series of the books, she is also given the name Swan Circling, which was one of her, uh, which was the name of one of the women in her tribe that she greatly admired. And she was given this name at a very important gift-giving ceremony, which could be called a potlatch, where um, gifts were given and received um, in a very ceremonious manner and it was incredibly important to their culture. Um, the, uh, in the Northwest, uh, today we would call it the Pacific Northwest region of what today is the United States. So Kaya's, uh, where Kaya would have lived would be parts of present day Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And she would have traveled around these areas based on a seasonal round. So they would move, her family and tribe would move each season to a different place. So in the summer, um, they would live in teepees and those teepees would be covered in specially woven mats and it would be the woman's job to move these teepees uh, when the time came for them to move in the seasonal round. Uh, to move these teepees, they would use travois, which would be a type of sled um, that would be dragged behind a horse. And a horse is also one of the um, points uh, that show that Kaya's world is changing because Kaya loves her horse Steps High and she loves riding that horse. But 50 years before Kaya was riding her horse Steps High, then there were no horses uh, in her tribe at all um, because horses were brought over by European settlers. Um, they were brought over from the what is considered the old world to the new world. <clears throat> Uh, and a lot of times in today, in imagery and uh, modern consciousness, we always think of Native Americans as having these horses and riding them, but that was not a part of their culture for in, in, until uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and came over and introduced a lot of new 
things such as horses or diseases, um, crops and such. That didn't happen until that exchange happened. <clears throat> but in the seasonal round, they had the horses that they were able to have the travois to take the teepees on. And because they had these travois, to put behind horses, they were able to also enlarge their teepees because they were able to move them. Otherwise, usually the woman would have to carry them or they would have a smaller travois behind a dog. Uh, man's best friend has been around for a very long time and has been helping out people all over civilization, uh, which was also evident in Kaya's novels. But from the seasonal round, like I said, they would have a teepee, but they would only use that in the summer months. When it came time to do the, in the seasonal round for the winter or the colder months, they would actually go to a more permanent village with a long house where either entire extended families would live or even sometimes entire tribes. It was very much dependent upon um, how many people were in that group of people, how many people were in that group. Um, and how big your living space and situation was. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything more. We can talk about her, her outfit here. Um, she was wearing a traditional outfit that would have been worn by a girl at that time. Here we have, uh, she has fringe and she has some beadwork on it that would have been uh, popular. Uh, the skin of her dress would have been made of elk or sheep. And it's very interesting part about this is that uh, females in this tribe would wear female skins of animals because they believed that it gave them the female swiftness and bravery and transferred that to them while they were wearing that animal skin, which I thought was in very, a very interesting uh, fact uh, that was very much a part of their culture was they believed that they were a part of nature and they respected nature greatly. Um, they did have, they had a very different concept of what it meant to have possessions um, and to give gifts. Um, so they did not own the the land, they did not feel like they had a sense of entitlement to the land. The land provided for them and they loved and respected the earth in return. Uh, the, some in Kaya's uh, religious beliefs of her people, uh, they would refer to like the earth as their mother and that they, they would have come from the earth and uh, Coyote, which is one of their spiritual uh, guides, uh, created the, their people and gave them like the most beautiful land that was found. And if you ever have gone up to the Pacific Northwest, uh, you will know that the scenery up there is absolutely gorgeous uh, and it, would, it is incredibly beautiful. You can see, see that carry over from her, her stories in the 1700s and those stories which go back we don't even know how far because they are oral to tradition. She would have listened at the feet of her grandmother or a tribal elder to hear these stories. And then she, if she was to become a tribal elder, would probably have passed those down to her, her children. Um, but of course, we don't know that in the books. The books only take place to the point where Kaya was about 8 to 10, 12 years old. We aren't really sure how old Kaya is because her, they didn't keep track of birthdays. They knew the, how many seasons they were old. So you didn't necessarily have a birthday. You just knew you were born in this season at this seasonal rotation uh, at that place. And then you would just count how many, how many summers or how many winters old you were. So there wasn't a, there's not exact dates that were kept in that, uh, that culture. What would Kaya have done for fun? Oh, so what would Kaya have done for fun? That's a good question. She obviously loves to ride her horse. I think she got in trouble trying to race her horse a couple of times. Uh, she had different um, games that she would play with the children in her village. I believe there was one stick game that would be the closest thing that we would have to an equivalent today would kind of be like a field hockey type of game. and. 
of course, she might also participate in different types of crafts. There was one point where she was very proud of herself for weaving her own bag. So she might also have done that, uh, participated in traditional crafts for fun. And uh, if for those of us who haven't read her story, uh, what kind of obstacles does she face or what, what's the story about? Ah, uh, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about Kaya's story. So Kaya, um, American Girl Doll has redone a lot of things. Originally there were six stories, but then they have all reconfigured them into a little bit. So I'm talking about uh, when I was a kid and I read them, I read them as a six-part six book series. Uh, but I assume they're, I think they're still the same today. <laughs> but uh, Kaya faces many challenges in her books. She, I think one of the biggest challenges that she faces was when the uh, Blackfeet tribe came and raided her village and took her and her adopted sister, Speaking Rain, captive. And then she had to figure out how to escape from them and find her way back to her family. And raids like this were very common in this time because they were fighting over uh, buffalo hunting rights uh, if they were to infringe on territories. So while they did not have a sense of land ownership as in this 12 by 12 piece of land is mine, there was still a very general idea of what resources belong to what tribe and what territories uh, belong to the different tribes in the United States. What types of foods might Kaya have, have eaten? So uh, buffalo was one of their hunting uh, one of the things that her people hunted, they would also have fished for salmon, and then they would also have gathered roots and nuts and berries very good. as well. That's all the questions we have about Kaya. All right. Very good. We're going to move on to Cecile and Marie Grace. Now, Cecile and Marie Grace, they live in a very interesting time period. They, their story takes place in 1853 during the yellow fever epidemic in New Orleans. Now, this, of course, the story starts earlier than that, and it starts uh, in the beginning of 1853, where it's carnival season, and that is an incredibly important time uh, in uh, French, Spanish, um, and Catholic culture, which New Orleans is greatly steeped in. New Orleans was really not an American town for the first 200 years of its existence. It Oh, when uh, Cecile and Marie Grace's story takes place, it had only been America since the Louisiana Purchase, which happened at the beginning of the 1800s, so barely 50 years, if that. <clears throat> so we come into New Orleans, and it has already been an established city for 200 years uh, with the French and Spanish, and therefore it has a very different cultural feel than the rest of um, the United States were the original 13 colonies that were predominantly settled by Dutch um, and English settlers for the first half or for most of the 1700s. So we come into New Orleans and we have Cecile who is a free person of color. She is actually quite wealthy, as you can see by her beautiful dress and her lovely ringlets here. She is very well-to-do, and, uh, and she has never been an enslaved person, and this is something that's also very unique to New Orleans, is that uh, a large segment of their population were free people of color, about one-third at this time in New Orleans. Uh, one-third of their population was free people of color. But that doesn't mean that New Orleans was this beautiful utopia where everyone was equal. There was still a lot of hardship and a lot of people who were enslaved and people who had different um, socioeconomic things and people were not treated equally. Even if she was a wealthy person, she was still a person of color and therefore at this time in society she wasn't treated necessarily as an equal to some of her um, Anglo-American white counterparts. But 
she does make friends with Marie Grace. Uh, they both love to sing. They uh, come together and find each other um, <clears throat> at a <clears throat> uh, having music lessons. That's where they came together and they met and then their friendship develops over the course of the stories. But they come together over a mutual love of singing. And <clears throat> I, I think Cecile Grace, she's, she's really trying, but she isn't that good. But she's taking lessons and hopefully she will get there. And Marie Grace is a sh more shy um, girl and she's impressed by Cecile's confidence. Um, and these two become perhaps what you might call unlikely friends. And they share their story over the course of the yellow fever epidemic. And it's very interesting perspectives because you have this wealthy free person of color and then you have this daughter of a doctor, it's because Marie's Grace's father was a doctor, who is going to treat these yellow fever patients, but her father, you, generally he's a kind-hearted man who would treat people poor people who didn't have the ability to pay and therefore Marie Grace is not as wealthy. She's not a wealthy daughter of a doctor. This doctor treats people who really need it, who are poor and can't always pay. And that's where a lot of the yellow fever epidemic happened. A lot of the wealthier people were able to stay inside their homes and not catch the fever while a lot of the Irish immigrants to New Orleans uh, ended up contracting disease and dying of it or suffering from it greatly. Now yellow fever was not anything new to America or new to New Orleans. This had happened almost every summer. There are some cases of it at the docks when the port, because New Orleans is a huge, huge port. It is pretty much second to only New York at this time for people coming in and bringing in goods and being a center of commerce. If you were a person looking to rise to the top in the South at this time, you would go to New Orleans because that's where you can make things happen, or that was the thought. If you were a young man trying to make your fortune, you go to New Orleans and you hop on a riverboat because New Orleans not only does it have access to the Gulf of Mexico, it also has access to the Mississippi River which can take you clear up the United States and to all of those new territories or newer territories that the United States had just acquired because of the Louisiana Purchase, which there was a lot of resources that people were trying to extract from there. Yes, but where was I? I was at Irish immigrants, wasn't I? There we go, before I got sidetracked. So <clears throat> a lot of times, the immigration influx, years that they had larger amounts of German or Irish immigrants, was years that they had a higher yellow fever outbreak because those people had never experienced yellow fever before and therefore were more susceptible to it, while people in New Orleans might have had some natural immunity to it because once you get yellow fever, you can never get it again. So if you had a mild chase case as a child, well then you're, you're fine for the rest of your life which a lot of people in New Orleans who had lived in New Orleans for their entire lives had. And th this is one of the things that Cecile very quickly uh, states in the book. She, she speaks French, as does Marie Grace, even though she had moved to Massachusetts and then came back with her family. So she, she's not as good with her French, but she, she's trying to relearn it. But Cecile Grace, she knows English and French and considers herself not necessarily American, but she's from New Orleans. She's uh, a girl from New Orleans, and that's how she identifies herself, uh, apart from just being American. And that confuses Marie Grace at first, because Louisiana is a part of America at this point, but there's still a very distinct culture in New Orleans where they define themselves as being from New Orleans because it's so different from the rest of the United States at this time. And if you ever go to New Orleans, there's still very much that spirit um, that you can only find in New Orleans, <clears throat> which is just in incredibly fun how history just, it, it, the spirit of, of a place can continue like that. Because 
uh, these girls, they went through some incredibly trying times. Um, they were worried about their family getting sick. They were trying to, Marie Grace ended up trying to help out at an orphanage because a lot of people lost their parents or they were falling on hard times where people lost their jobs um, and they had, couldn't feed their kids and they had to send them to an orphanage. And Marie Grace went there and tried to help and play with the kids and provide any type of comfort that she could uh, because it was a very hard time. But in New Orleans, they got through it. Uh, the yellow fever epidemic only lasted the summer, and then it got better again. And of course, they had more, yellow fever never went away. It still occurred, but it just occurred in not um, as high of numbers as it did in the summer of 1853. Now yellow fever is spread through mosquito bites and no one really understood this at this time because they didn't understand germs. But they did understand that sick people sh and well people, if you put them together in a room, the sick person would get the well person sick. So they understood some semblance of that. Um, people try to stay in their homes away from other people. Uh, and then they did some very interesting things. I think my favorite thing that they did to try to get rid of the virus uh, was shoot cannons. They would shoot cannons over the city and attempt to frighten the virus away. And I, I just think that's an incredibly <laughs> amusing antidote. <laughs> they would also light like fires. So they would have bonfires on like every street. And for some reason they chose to burn tar, which created a big thick black smoke that just covered the city. Which I guess kept people in their homes because you wouldn't want to go walk outside and tar smoke. Um, so, th but they thought that was going to clear the air or clear the, the air and drive the virus out. There was also some uh, reports where they, if someone was going to get really sick, they would try to quarantine them on an island that was right off the coast of New Orleans. And that was one thing that they would also do. Um, and then they also had closed down the borders of their town and no one was allowed in or out of New Orleans um, during some heightened times. Uh, of that epidemic. And it's called an epidemic because it's just because it wasn't all over the United States, it was not all over the world, it was just that one city of New Orleans that was suffering from the yellow fever. Oh yes, we have question. questions. Yes, um, we're also curious, we're probably going to be curious about what all of these girls would have eaten. Ooh, <laughs> yes, that's always a good thing. So. New Orleans is known for having French style food, which is different. It has more um, butter soups, things. butter, um, bread, yeah. bread, definitely. <clears throat> uh, it also is known for having some more spices, which has some Caribbean and African flavor to the dishes because uh, I'm not sure if anyone has been to England, but last summer when I went to England, they still don't put spices in anything. Uh, which is very different from the rest of America this time, who was predominantly English and cooking in English ways. Uh, New Orleans knew how to use spices and liked to um, use spices in their dishes. And they have, in starting, I mean, it started far, far back before these girls were around, but there is very much a distinct st uh, style that carries through that we would consider like Creole or Cajun cooking. Uh, the idea of like gumbo, which is a uh, very uh, native to that region and have different styles of cooking that kind of gumbo. Um, jambalaya. And jambalaya. And oh, and they're also right on the, ghost, uh, on the coast. So seafood is a big factor in their diet as well. And uh, can you talk about what would they have done for fun? Ah, oh, so what would Cecile and Marie Grace have done for fun? So obviously they both enjoy singing, or they're taking singing lessons. In the books they go to a ball, which is part of the carnival celebration, which a uh, carnival starts at Twelfth Night, um, which is 12 days after Christmas. So if you think about the 12 days of Christmas, it's not the 12 days leading up to Christmas, it's the 12 days 
after Christmas that ends on Twelfth Night. And that's generally when uh, Three Kings Day is celebrated on Twelfth Nights when the arrival of uh, the th three kings are, uh, come to visit uh, Jesus in the manger, um, in, that, in the Christian tradition. And then you have Twelfth Night, and then you have Carnival, which ends in Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras is the highlight of this uh, Carnival season. And then uh, also this speaks to the Catholic culture that was very predominant in New Orleans, which is not necessarily seen in the rest of the United States as heavily because New Orleans, it was Spanish and then it was French. And those are two nations that had Catholicism far longer than England because England broke with the church in Rome in the 1500s, so King Henry VIII could marry Anne Boleyn. And that's when the Anglican church was started. And then also German Protestantism started in the 1500s as well because of Martin Luther. But, England, but France and Spain, who had colonized New Orleans in that area, were still very heavily Catholic, and that is very evident in the culture of these girls because they go to this Mardi Gras carnival ball, which, is, of course, they have fun, they get to dress up, they get to dance, um, which, of course, is a very fun pastime. Uh, another, but it's important to note that these girls uh, because of the color of their skin, were not actually able to attend the same balls. They went to balls that were held at the same place, but they were in separate ballrooms, uh, just because um, they did not look the same. Can we talk about their dresses and your dresses? Yes, so we're going to talk about their dresses. So these girls, they are wearing very fashionable 1850s outfits. Cecile Grace, we can tell she has a slightly finer dress. It's more satin and she has some pretty trim here uh, with beautiful rose embroidery. She, These girls, they have their hair down. That was very common for young girls at this time because we, we remember they're around the ages of 8 to 10 in their story. Uh, another thing that you know because they're small girls, they have shorter skirts and you can actually see the top of their pantalettes that are there. And you can see their beautiful little boots that have buttons on the side. Very fashionable at this time. Uh, <laughs> there we go. We'll show the little, I just think the little buttons are adorable. Um, and then they would have their stockings, and then they have their pantalettes, and then they would have the chemise that goes closest to their skin because they do live in New Orleans and it was still very hot. So when you sweat, their chemise would catch the sweat so then they wouldn't have to wash their beautiful dresses as much. Another fashionable thing in the 1850s was to have a layered skirt like this. Um, that was just a fashion trend in the 1850s was to have different ruffled skirts. Um, we also note that they are younger girls because they have shorter sleeves and they have, uh, I guess, um, wider necklines uh, would be the, the correct term to describe that. Um, they are not as covered up because they're young girls. They're going to play, they're going to move and have fun. Um, again, that's why they have shorter skirts, shorter sleeves, um, not as uh, high necklines because these girls are going to go out and they're going to have fun. But they also have crinolines, which a cage crinoline. Here, we're going to show her cage crinoline here. Um, and that is what holds their skirt out. So it's two rungs connected by ribbon um, as they have it designed here. And then that holds their skirt out to the side, which was also a very fashionable thing during the 1850s. And then my dress, I based it, um, it's an 1850s design. I wear it because it kind of looked like Marie Grace's dress. I also did my hair a little bit like Marie Grace. Uh, if I was actually a lady living back then, I would have my hair turned up because uh, it would be improper for my, me to have my hair down when I was to go out in public. Uh, but for the sake of looking like Marie Grace today, because uh, we already shared the same first name, <laughs> I decided to, to do that. Um, but another thing of the 1850s that you can see, was a fashionable thing was to have uh, the waistline is here, but then it has like this fun decorative kind of tail, for lack of a better word, that would go around the skirt. Um, I'm also wearing a hoop skirt or a cage crinoline. And then I have these long sleeves, which shows that I'm an older, uh, I am 
past the age of puberty and therefore I am a woman. And uh, these sleeves, which make my waist look tiny because uh, that was one of the fashion trends, but people didn't necessarily, uh, they, they used their clothes to create illusions um, instead of trying to fit their bodies into a new beauty standard of whatever. Uh, so the sleeves make my are big and they make my waist look tiny and then I also have a giant hoop skirt which also makes my waist look tiny. Uh, and then I have the fun like square neckline and a collar that would protect my uh, dress because if I was to you know sweat or get something eat and get something on my collar it's attachable so I can just wash my collar, collar instead of t taking off my entire dress and washing that. And we have questions. Uh, well, we have a comment. Uh, Gwyneth, who uh, turned 12 today, uh, just loves your dress. So just oh, happy you birthday, wish. Gwyneth. Yes. And thank you. <laughs> but I think we can move on. To All right. Now. So we're going to move on to Rebecca here. So Rebecca, she lives in 1914 New York. So we have girls from all over the country in all time periods today. And Rebecca uh, is very interesting. She starts out her story. She is a Russian immigrant. Well, her family is uh, are immigrants from Russia. She was born in the United States. So her grandparents and her mother were born in Russia and came to America through Ellis Island, which is an Im the immigration point uh, for the Atlantic seaboard into America. And then many immigrants decided to stay in New York or were, had no means to travel to other parts of the United States and therefore settled in New York. And she lives with her brothers and sisters um, in the uh, perhaps what we would consider um, the not as affluent area of New York and a tenement building that also has row houses um, where people are stacked together very, very tightly. Uh, she lives her entire ex family lives in an apartment that would probably be considered to be like a one bedroom apartment today with a sitting room and a kitchen and then also a fire escape because I think she liked to go out and sit on there. And in 1914 it's a very interesting time um, in the world in general because that is when World War I starts. But America is not predominantly affected by World War I and at least they do not enter World War I actively until a few years later. But for a person who has family in Russia at this time, it would be very scary and they were very concerned about their family in Russia. And therefore, they wanted to be able to send for them. Uh, it also is important to note that Rebecca and her family are uh, Jewish and they celebrate the Jewish faith, um, which is another interesting part of the story of her trying to identify herself as a Russian Jewish American girl because she has her very traditional grandparents who are very, very traditional. And then she has her parents who also have certain ideas of like what she should be and how she should act and what she should do. And then she has, you know, she goes to school in an, uh, a very American school who doesn't necessarily understand that she doesn't celebrate Christmas, she celebrates Hanukkah. Um, so you have these cultures collide and she has to figure this out for herself and her family about what she's going to do about all that. She also uh, speaks some Yiddish. Uh, there are Yiddish words in the book, which I think is really fun. Um, all of these girls, they speak different languages. So Rebecca, she speaks some Yiddish and has Yiddish words in her book. Um, Cecile and Marie Grace, they speak French some and they have French words in their book. And then obviously uh, Kaya, who would have known no English because she had not had interactions to where she would need to or have a chance to learn. Uh, she speaks the language of her people, which is the language of the Ninipu. Uh, and they have glossaries in the back of all these books. And I just, I think it's so very fun to go and uh, learn words from these different languages. <clears throat> so Rebecca, she's trying to figure all of this out. It's a very interesting time in the world, especially to be a girl in 1914, because you're very close to 
women getting the right to vote. Things are changing at a very rapid pace. We have technology that they hadn't had, like the automobile and electricity, and all of these very interesting uh, new inventions that are coming onto the scene. So to finish the story about the World War I and immigration, her family was very concerned about the family in Russia because not only is World War I about to start, the Russian Revolution is about to start uh, because Russia exits World War I and then has their own political revolution where the Tsar is overthrown, he and his family are shot in their basement, well, in the basement of where they were being held, um, and it's a completely different political system, but that's a completely different topic that we could do a, another live cast about. Anyway, they're very concerned about their family and therefore they save up money to buy tickets uh, so that her uncle and the, his family, which includes her cousin Anna, which she gets to know very well in the books, to come over. And Rebecca, she does needlework and like these lace work that they sell, um, that she sells in her father's shoe shop to raise money to bring over her family, which is incredibly heartwarming. Um, and she knows she didn't raise enough to buy a whole ticket, but she knows that she helped and she was part of the, the effort to get her family to a place where they could be together and safe. And then they go to Ellis Island and they welcome their new family. Her father actually has to go um, into Ellis Island and sign papers to say that he would help support this, his brother, her uncle, um, as they transitioned into America. Um, so some things, it seems, uh, have, have not changed all that much with the idea of um, trying to become an American and what it means to, to do that. Um, even though they did it through uh, Ellis Island, but Ellis Island uh, opened in the late 1800s and then went, uh, was the immigration point where if you could get on, if you had enough money to get on a boat and come to Ellis Island, uh, you had a very good chance of being able to be processed and then come into America as an American citizen. But that's not always the case. Some people got turned away at Ellis Island if they had any suspicion of any type of disease. If you had any type of disease that they thought you might have like an eye problem, if they thought you might have some type of contagious disease especially, uh, you were either sent directly back on the boat or you were taken to the Ellis Island Hospital, which is very large, um, and held there until either your disease cleared up or they determined that you were just ill or, or you died, and then they would figure out what to do with you from that point on. Uh, so it was a very harrowing journey to even get through that process. <clears throat> Another thing that Rebecca loves to do is act. And this is another thing where she kind of butts heads with her family because they don't think that a young girl should be an actress or a lady has a place on the stage. It still kind of carries a stigma of not being um, the most reputable place, especially for a young woman. And that goes back centuries. Um, and it's beginning to change in this time period that Rebecca lives in because Rebecca, her, her other uncle, her mother's uncle, is actually a movie star. And that's a big new thing in the 1914s is movies and moving pictures. Because uh, her uncle, uh, who was the actor, he was always an actor, but originally he had been in vaudeville shows, which is kind of like a small sketch, song and dance, comedy, traveling troupe. And then he signs on with a movie company and suddenly his work is much more steady because he is part of a sedimentary company and it's based in New York where she lives. But then it moves to California, to Hollywood. And that is when we have the beginning of Hollywood is when uh, her uncle, he, he's like one of the first wave actors who move out to California to star in these motion pictures, um, which is very, very new. Uh, they are much shorter and 
very different from the movies that we have today. Uh, for one thing, they were silent. The actors had to convey their emotions just through their expressions and movements. They did not have the ability to record sound. Sound and motion picture are two different things that you have to then combine. Uh, for a lot of the process, our cameras do that for us today for the most part, but uh, it's still uh, different. Have you ever, you know, watched a movie and like the sound is different from the picture? It's same same type of uh, concept that we have when you just, they couldn't figure out how to do that. Uh, because they were able to record sound and they were able to record picture, but they hadn't figured out how to put them together. Um, because one of the things Rebecca likes to do is listen to her phonograph, which is like the beginning of a record player, which is a predecessor to a CD. And some kids are going to look at me like they have no idea what I'm talking about, but you know, you can Google it and it'll, it'll be good. Um, but it's a basically a large round disc that you put a needle in and then you can hear music from it. And that's the thing that Rebecca loved to do. She loved to sing and dance. Um, and uh, do things um, like that and to perform. Uh, and she, I think she, she was a very determined and brave young girl. Uh, she even get, tried to attempt to give a speech at a union rally because uh, a lot of immigrants at this time had very terrible working conditions um, and the whole idea of labor unions and having like Labor Day was forming where people would go on strike and not work in their awful conditions in order to promote better working conditions. Um, and she was part of that movement um, as well and tried to give a speech, which also speaks to her theatrical presence, um, that she is willing to get up there and say what she thinks in front of a large group of people. <clears throat> uh, so do we have any questions about we Rebecca? Well, we are curious about what types of foods would Jewish Americans eat during this time? Ah, yes. Yeah. So uh, one thing that a Jewish American might eat during this time would be a matzo bell soup. And I believe, uh, oh, challah? Challah bread. Challah bread is another thing. I believe she actually references that in uh, the stories when they have their um, special Friday night meals. And also, she does in, um, what, I want to get the name of the, the story correct. It is called Candlelight for Rebecca, which is um, her, the story about her celebrating Hanukkah. She eats lakis, and she loves uh, these potato pancakes um, that they use predominantly. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure you can eat lakis whenever you would like, but it's very traditional to have them with your Hanukkah meal. Okay. And what would Rebecca do for fun? So Rebecca, um, one of the things that she would do for fun that's referenced in the books is go down to the soda fountain where she would then go and uh, kind of like an ice cream parlor today uh, it was a big thing. Soda was new. It was developed like Coca-Cola was developed in the late 1890s. Um, so by 1914, it's still a pretty new invention and it's fun, uh, you know, it's still, it's a fun sensation to have like the bubbles in your mouth and like the sweet drink. Uh, so she would go down to the soda fountain and she would sit there and uh, drink her soda and listen to the phonograph and learn new songs that way because the radio hadn't been invented yet. The only way you had to listen to music was either by someone singing it or this newfangled thing called a phonograph. So she wanted to go and learn all the words to the new songs so that she could then go back and sing them with her friends. Alright, um, so now we're curious about who is your favorite American Girl doll? Oh, okay, so the question was, who, what's my favorite American Girl doll? That's a very hard question, because I feel like that's like trying to ask someone like what their favorite pet is. Um, I, I like all of them for different reasons. Um, I have always been drawn to Felicity's stories. I, I love her spunk and her adventure. I think the American Revolution is a really interesting time period. I've also really liked Kirsten and her idea um, of the American frontier and um, her journey, because with Kirsten, uh, she is an immigrant. We start her story on the boat with her coming over uh, to America, which I find very interesting. Oh, we, we forgot to talk about uh, Rebecca's clothing. Oh, we forgot to talk about Rebecca's clothing. How dare we? 
So Rebecca is wearing a very fashionable outfit um, from the 1914s. As we can see, we are heading into the 1920s. We already have that silhouette going on with the dropped waist um, and the shorter skirts. Uh, she has boots that look very much like uh, the ones that we had Cecile and Marie Grace wearing. Um, shoe wear had not changed all that much um, at this time. And then she has some very nice velvet cuffs um, and a velvet collar. And her buttons are asymmetrical, which is a very fun fashion choice that she has there. She has um, a almost look like a cloche hat. It's not quite the 1920s cloche hat that we think about, but it's very close. It fits close down to her head and she has this beautiful embroidered ribbon. Another thing that's really important to note is here we have her rabbit brooch and that is a very much traditional Russian um, uh, craft. It's a, a Russian lacquered brooch um, which is really fun. Uh, one of, I have a sweet memory from this that might be fun because I think a, a lot of the reasons I, we love American Girl dolls um, and such like um, it's because we also have our childhood memories tied to them and also we have our own experiences as being American girls that we can relate to being American girls and their stories. Um, but when I um, got Rebecca when I was younger, my grandmother actually gave me a Russian uh, lacquered brooch that she had gotten when she had visited Russia um, so that I could match my doll and I thought it was really sweet and I still have it. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about the American Girl Company? All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about American Girl Company. So originally it started in the 1980s. They only had three dolls and from there they grew. Um, I believe the original dolls were Samantha, Molly, and Kirsten. So Samantha's time period is 1904, Molly's time period is 1944, and then Kirsten's time period is 1854 which I think is very fun. They, for a long time, they, they stuck with the fours. Um, I've, so because that's, it's good, it's right in the middle of the decade, um, and that way it's easier to encapsulate all that happened within that decade, um, because the stories, obviously, they go, they start out usually, when I read them, with like the meat, the, the meat book, so you, it's just introduction to the character, and then it, follows them through like a whole year and it's not necessarily a calendar year it feels more like an academic year so by that point it would be uh, 18 uh, 1915 uh, this is one of the first times they actually did a doll that was not on a four year because 1853 was such an important time in New Orleans with the yellow fever epidemic which was one of the worst epidemics that America had seen up to that point uh, that they chose to move it back here to 1853 uh, because there was an outbreak in 1854. It was nowhere near as terrible as it was during 1853. So that was one of the interesting things that um, American Girl, the company, had has changed um, or has reoriented. And then, of course, from those three American Girl dolls, they have expanded greatly. Um, they have put out new dolls, taken dolls into retirement, and then brought them back out again. Uh, there was a time where they, they liked to create best friends for the dolls that were in the stories. They would create a doll uh, to embody that best friend. And then another very interesting thing about Cecile and Marie Grace is the, they were the first friends that were released together. Um, that their stories, they, there was no just six books about the one doll where the other one was a side character, they had it where their story was equally. They had three books for each doll, which I thought was another fun, interesting fact. Also interesting to note that the company was founded by a woman named Pleasant Rowland. Ah, okay, so, um, so it was started out as a Pleasant Company, and that is because the company was founded by a woman named Pleasant Rowland. Rowland, yes. <laughs> Very good, okay. Um, so now we want to know how long did it take to make your dress and how long, how would they acquire their clothing in each era? Oh, that is a good question. So how long did it take my dress and then how did they acquire their clothing and how long did it take to make? Um, I feel this is actually the, one of the first historical, uh, dresses that I ever attempted to make. So therefore I think it took me longer than it does now because I was new to the whole idea of historical garments. But I, I think it took me probably several weeks, probably 
a month at most. Uh, different things for these dolls. Um, Kaya would obviously, they would have to acquire the animal through hunting or trapping. And then they would skin the animal, uh, treat the hide, and then they would sew it into a very unique garment that would be very personal to them. That would be their garment. As we talked about a little bit earlier, they would use the hides of female animals because they believed that that gave them the uh, bravery and swiftness um, and agility of that female animal um, that they were then going to embody. So very much, uh, Perhaps, you know, Kaya, that she would have to be taught how to make her own clothes by older female relatives or other females in her tribe, and then to create that outfit, and then she could create them on her own, and then probably end up teaching other people how to do the same. For Cecile and Marie Grace, Cecile is so well to do. She would probably have a dressmaker that was dedicated uh, or you know one of the fine New Orleans tailors that would then custom make all of her beautiful gowns. Where Marie Grace, um, she might have at some point when she is older start making her own outfits. She um, her mother, if her mother were still alive, would have probably helped make her outfits otherwise um, they could also be bought from a tailor, but they would probably just not be, of course, like as fine of fabric or quality as Cecile Grace's might have been. Uh, so still very much you had to, you would make your own clothes or acquire them from a tailor uh, or a seamstress in this time period. And then we go to Rebecca, and Rebecca is at the beginning of the 1900s and 1914. We have the beginning of clothing factories, and that's one of the things that she notes in her book is like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, um, these clothing factories that are making predominantly shirtwaist, which is like that white blouse that we all think about when we think about an early 1900s woman in the skirt. Uh, that outfit is called a shirtwaist, and those are being mass produced in New York during this time. So therefore, mass-produced clothing has started. She could go to a store, a department store, which is also fairly new at this time, and go and buy her own outfit for a reasonable cost. All right, um, and we're wondering how many American girls are there today, and looking at it right now, it seems that there are at least 30 now. So we have, so how many American girl dolls are there today is the question. Um, if you want to talk about how many like dolls of the year there are, that started in 2001, it's 2020, there have been 19 of those. Uh, if you want to talk about historical characters, um, I think we have about 12. I'm not sure if that counts their best friends. Add another five or six to that count. Um, and then there's the just like you dolls. Uh, and I think there's like another 20 of those. So overall, if we're talking about like all dolls, probably around upwards of 30 to 50. All right. Um Let's see. And oh, we want to know uh, what book would you recommend to start with? Oh, that's a good question. So the question was, what book would I recommend to start with? Well, if you want to go in chronological order, I would recommend Kaya's book that we have here. This is my collection of her story collection in one book. Uh, it's one book that contains the six, but now I think they have a different but you can go and figure that out. Um, I think there's like three books that they combined, so they're like longer chapter books. Um, so I would consider that if you wanted to go in chronological order. Some of my favorite books, um, I really like the ones that are by Valerie Tripp. She was one of my favorite authors um, from the American Girl Doll Collection, and she wrote a, a number of them. Uh, but Felicity, I think, is probably still one of my favorite story sets uh, from uh, the American Girl Doll Collection, but I do, I like all of them, so I, I wouldn't, I, th I don't think you can go wrong with whichever one you pick. All right, and what was your first American Girl Doll? Uh, so the question was, what was my first American Girl Doll? So my first American Girl Doll was one of those uh, ones that looked just like you, um, so she, she was a cute little brown-haired girl with bangs, um, and I named her Christine, and then I got a Girl of the Year, and my first girl of the year was 
Kylie, Kaylee, Ky Kaylee, who liked to surf. And then my first historical character doll was actually Nellie, which was Samantha's best friend. <laughs> And overall, what do you think the American Girl stories teach young girls? And oh. what would these characters want young girls to know today? That's a, that's a big question. So uh, the question was, what do I think uh, these dolls teach young girls? Or um, what, would these girl, what would these dolls want uh, girls today to know? Um, I think they each have their own specific story, but I think all of them are very true to themselves and true to their interest and pursue their interest and what they believe and are not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. Um, if I had to summarize um, the multiple stories of these multiple very unique individuals over large time spans and uh, large demographic uh, and different belief systems, I would say that would be the overarching theme that I have gotten from American Girl Dolls is um, be the best that you can be um, because there's only one of you. I think we'll end there because you can think All right. So, that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much for coming to watch today. If you are interested in us doing another one of these where we look at some more dolls, go ahead and comment below which dolls you would be interested in having a little more historical background on. And we are at the Northeast Georgia History Center. We thank you so much for watching. And if you would like to make your thanks known in a tangible way, we would love for you to donate to our institution. You can do so by going to our website and clicking the Donate Now button. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again.